Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. On this edition, we'll relish the tradition of sauerkraut days, meet a Vietnam veteran, and listen to a blues musician from Winona, Minnesota. German from Russia children, growing up in rural South Dakota during the Great Depression, were no strangers to hard work. When that one-room schoolhouse bell rang in the fall, it was like a vacation from the daily grind of farming. They knew that education was their ticket to a better life. I look upon my childhood with fondness. Uh, I wouldn't want to relive it, but I am who I am because of it. You know, the one thing about growing up in, in those kind of circumstances, we didn't think we were poor. You know, uh, but when you look back, we were at poverty level. We were working for other people, and it, they had hired my father. My mother would take care of the cooking and things like that for the hired men and people. But at that point, Dad said they hadn't hired me. So now I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to milk cows or any of that stuff. I grew up on a farm. It was a grain farm, basically. We had a variety of animals, cattle, of course, milked a lot of cows by hand. You worked from before sunup to long after sundown, and there never seemed to be an end of it. We looked forward to school. School for us was a vacation. We were in a one-room school. The little ones sat in the front, and we didn't have indoor plumbing, there was no we had outhouses, and it was just a typical farm school, you know. They had a rule, a kid, the older children in school were supposed to speak English out on the playground. Everybody I knew was German, and we all talked German, and we just sat in the front row, you know, in school, and, and the older kids were behind us, and they all were being taught in English, so we kind of learned it. I had an advantage. I was the fourth child, and so I had older brothers and sisters who were already in country school, and my mother was very adamant about education. I went to 13 schools in 12 years, back in the days when people didn't travel around very much. It was a big deal to go to the next county, and you know, I did grades one, two, and three in my very comfortable school. I went to Detroit, I started the first month in a big city school with all kinds of people I had never had any connection with in my life. I was afraid of them. Uh, I didn't know how to jump rope. I mean, we chased goofers. <laughs> and came back, and then I lived in, in town for two years. So now I was a town child and running around the streets with the town kids, and <laughs> fighting the farm kids on Saturday night. <laughs> I graduated from Jackson Number One Happy Land School, all eighth grades. There was no question I went to grade school. When it came time for high school, I had to fight. Because my dad, he didn't think I needed high school. Girls just got married anyhow. My father would have had us conclude our education at the end of country school. He felt by going to town school, we'd just pick up smart aleck ideas. I just knew I wanted to go to school and I fought for it. I remember standing out in the cow barn while he was milking, arguing <laughs> with him. And they finally said, well, you can, you can go one year. I got my foot in the door. I never took it back out. <laughs> I graduated. My mother was very adamant about education. She felt that the world was changing and in many ways, she was a very foresighted woman. 
and she said all of the children must have an education, high school education. Dad's role was different. He had to provide, providing for a family of eight and with the depression and losing his wife's farm, we became renters then and it wasn't until after World War II when my brothers came back from uh, the Second World War that uh, we finally were able to repurchase a farm. What kept me in school was that I wanted to work in an office. I had seen movies with these girls that worked in offices and I thought, boy, that's what I want. One of the reasons I think I, I eventually went into teaching was because of my fourth and fifth grade teacher. La Violet Druitt was my fourth grade teacher. She liked us. She not only looked good, she smelled good to us farm kids. The sad part of it was Miss La Violet uh, decided to get married after the first year, but before she left, she promised that we would get an equally good teacher. And believe it or not, her sister, LaVon Druitt, became our fifth grade teacher, and she was just as good as La Violet. Country school for us was escape, escape from the hard work of the farm, the milking, the morning milking, the mucking of the barns, uh, the hay in the winter months and all of the other summer activities of shocking grains, um, stacking hay. Uh, those were work days and I was not a farmer. Happiest day of my life was when I finally got the scholarship to leave the farm. Life is what it is when it's going on around you and you just accept it as a child. It was survival, it was existence, it was not luxurious, and yet we made the best of it. Prairie Public produced a documentary called Prairie Memories, the Vietnam War Years, in which we recorded oral histories of people who served, who stayed behind, or who fled their war-torn country for a new life. Army veteran Daryl Dorgan, who went from protester to Army draftee, spoke of the heavy medical price many Vietnam veterans are still paying due to Agent Orange. My name is Daryl Dorgan. I live in Bismarck, North Dakota. I'm a journalist and I'm a Vietnam veteran. I sat in front of the White House, I think it was January 21st, 1968, with some other people, young people from, from uh, Quentin Burdick's office, and watched the inaugural parade. And later that afternoon, we became involved in the demonstration against the Vietnam War. Little did I know that five and a half months later, I'd be there. But I got drafted, and uh, in July of 1969, I ended up in Vietnam with the head of the head battery of the 24th Corps Artillery. We got sprayed a lot with a chemical called Agent Orange. Agent Orange is something that, that is a fascinating topic. Uh, I have a bit of a problem with it. Many other Vietnam veterans do. It's, it's nothing that, that uh, they can cure. You had no idea what was happening when it was happening to you. You would have uh, planes come over about 150 feet spraying this defoliant. You just sat there and it would kind of rain on you. And, but I, I, I suspect the problem is much more widespread than anyone has ever admitted. A lot of people are paying a heavy medical price for what happened there. At the time, what you were trying to do is just make it till tomorrow. Make it till next month. From the time you got to Vietnam, you were in your helmet, 364 and a wake up, because you only had to do 365 days and you'd get rotated out. So you'd write 364 and a wake up. You weren't worried about anything except getting to 363, 362, 361. And, you know, if the government was spraying with this stuff, it must be safe. You know, the uncle, it just kind of shows you the futility of what happened. There were 58,000 young men and women who died there, and uh, for what is the big question. These are people who would have raised families. These are people who would have gone to college, would have contributed to society, and instead got caught up in a maelstrom that no one can really explain today. Why? Sauerkraut Days is an event put on by local businesses in Wishick, North Dakota for over 90 years. 1,500 people take part in this free event where they listen to polka music, eat hot dogs and sauerkraut, followed by some tasty desserts. 
I'm Cleo Boshi. I'm a resident of Wishit, North Dakota. This is our 91st one. Uh, it's always been free to the public, which is one of the things people that come from out of state to attend this, well, where do we buy the ticket? This is free. Well, there aren't a lot of free things today, I guess, anymore. You know, it was something that the business people wanted to do just to kind of say thank you to their people that patronized them and, and purchased uh, you know, most of their supplies right here in town. Normally we have about 1,500 people that turn out for this event. You notice all the politicians we had there today, uh, they all get a chance to kind of toot their own horn a little bit and uh, say a few things about it. Wishik is a great community. We're 100 miles from, we say, everywhere. We call ourselves the sauerkraut capital of the nation. 500 pounds of wieners, uh, 110 gallons of sauerkraut, 200 pounds of speck, which is fat. That's just some of the food that they serve and probably very little left over. Our uh, music instructor, you notice she's got the kids playing accordion and that's kind of a dying art. Uh, we're a small school, there's only 200 and probably 20 students in the entire school. And you saw the group today, I mean the band and the choir, they were singing German songs, playing polka music. I mean it fits right into our heritage. Right now we're in the Baptist church here and they have a pie social every time that we have sauerkraut days here. They're all made by the women of the church here. Oh yeah, that's why they're so good. And so you can see it draws quite a crowd. You know, we've got a lot of recognition from this, not only in the local community, but all over. I mean, people just, they put that on their calendar. It's the second Wednesday of October. And if anybody wants to come next year, that's when it's gonna be. I've gotten to know a lot of people just from sauerkraut. They, they come in and next year they come back and they give you a hug and you shake their hand and they say, well, you remember us, you know, and which is you know, kind of nice. Here's a segment from Prairie Public's documentary series built on agriculture that focuses on teaching the younger generations of consumers to realize how things in their everyday lives intersect with agriculture. Agriculture in the classroom. So I get to go all over the province of Manitoba speaking to students like you about agriculture because we So Agriculture in the Classroom is a very dynamic organization here in the province and what we do essentially is connect students at all ages, so kindergarten to grade 12, to agriculture to understand what agriculture means to them in their everyday life. So we want them to understand, of course, that the food on their plate comes from agriculture, but we take it even further than that and so that they understand that agriculture is all around them. It's the floor we walk on, it's paint on the walls, it's, it's things they might not even think about. It's the toothpaste they use in the morning. So we want them to understand that agriculture is around them every day in everything they do and help them make that connection. We have a very successful program called the Made in Manitoba Breakfast Program. We come into the school and we feed the whole student body a hot breakfast coupled with an educational component that they learn about everything they're about to eat and how that should matter to them. And then the students get to eat a hot breakfast and everything on the plate is a Made in Manitoba product. And then the finishing touch on that is when we serve up the food, the people representing and serving up each of the food items are farmers who produce that food right in the communities where we are. I measure success when we walk out of a school after a program and you've got kids thanking farmers for what they did to make that food appear on the plate. I'm Doug Chorney and I live and farm in East Selkirk, Manitoba, just north of Winnipeg. My grandfather came to Canada and started farming in 1903 and my parents established the yard site where I'm farming after that in 1939. While many people think of Western Canada as being all prairie and people just turned over the sod and started farming, our family broke bush. Uh, we were in the dark black soil zone which is quite stony and full of trees and our parents uh, and grand grandparents said did a lot of breaking of land, but my grandfather worked quite hard at that. By 1928, they were farming nearly 3,000 acres and had 75 horses on the farm to provide power. Today on our farm, we still grow wheat and we grow uh, oats and soybeans and canola and grow some vegetables on a small basis for the uh, fresh market that we have a retail store right on our farm and sell produce to the public, as well as being a commercial grain farm. Well, it's something my mother started uh, in the 60s and we've uh, let it evolve over the years and uh, I became really enthused with it uh, when I was in university and 
made it my summer job to operate that business and in partnership with my parents and now my daughter's in university and 19 years old and she's become a partner in the business and is really active in the management and running of the store so it is a nice way for the uh, family to transition into making business decisions and, and also interacting with the public which is a valuable life skill you can use in whatever career you pursue. Well I've uh, come to this line of work out of uh, desire and, and love of the practice of producing food. I'm actually a professional engineer by training and worked off the farm after university for several years and decided when my daughter was born actually that I wanted to be home more and have a, a life that accommodated uh, time with my family and I quit my job in 1993 to farm full-time and I've you know made sacrifices perhaps in my professional career but I feel it's been well worth it. It's, uh, it's very fulfilling to be a farmer and it's a challenge at times from uh, you know an economic point of view to get through and maintain the standard of living that you become accustomed to when you're in a salaried position and thankfully my wife has kept her job and she's a nurse uh, but you'll find that quite often with young farmers now that there there are uh, multiple incomes coming to the household to keep everything going and make it sustainable. Well because we have this retail uh, store on our farm, I have the chance to talk to consumers all the time that come to visit us and I'm always amazed at their their curiosity as to what is going on on the farm because there isn't really a chance to experience that inside the city. In, in Winnipeg, when you go to the grocery store, everything you need you can generally find and it's only when they want something unique like fresh produce that they come out to a farm and when they see all the other things going on, I'm you know really uh, encouraged by the fact that they want to know more about how food is produced and and hear the stories of what's going on on the farm. So there's an appetite, not just for food, but for, for knowledge about how their food's produced. More so in recent times with food safety issues, uh, people are becoming a lot more aware of the fact that it's a good thing to have farmers in Manitoba producing food close to home. Mike Munson of Winona, Minnesota is well known for his skilled finger picking while playing the blues. His original lyrics tell the stories of everyday hardships and his own travels. You may steal your breath, steal your face, whatever you take. You can't replace He walks inside Never plays it straight And always comes early And always stays late He's the right girl Right girl devil Right girl Right girl devil Well he took me to the river It's high and wide The only way over on the other side Steel gates snapping and have my heels the pin pricks of Charlie Horse Exactly how I feel. Well, I'm laughing to myself, taking pictures in my mind. I got such a high number, stuck way back here in line with the right girl. Hi, my name is Mike Munson. I live in Winona, Minnesota. I've been playing guitar and music for a long time. I guess most folks would call it blues or country blues. I started playing guitar uh, sometime in middle school and 
uh, I think really just grabbed a hold of me. And especially music made by, you know, people that we would consider I mean, not necessarily professional uh, musicians or in professional scenarios like studios seem to have a different quality to me than a lot of other recordings that I was listening to. And stylistically, I, I loved uh, solo performers with their instrument and their efforts to try to make as much noise as possible. So that's kind of the road I went down as far as uh, playing finger-picked guitar and then the, the, the idea of slide guitar is almost a, a third character in that. So I enjoy that very much. Going after that sound again, you know, been working on it, but I don't think you ever quite, you ever quite get there. It's one. 
not only this night for sure. If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Dambach. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.